So welcome everyone to the BDO and Queensland Government Department of Agriculture and Fisheries webinar on mon monitoring your business continuity response. Today's webinar is the fourth in a series that we've developed primarily to support the food and agribusiness sector. Today's webinar will undertake a deeper dive into real life continuity examples to use in considering your ongoing business continuity response. But before we get into it, as normal, I just wanna introduce myself. I'm Mark Cushing, a partner in, in advisory at BDO in Brisbane. Um, I'm primarily responsible for strategy and transformation, which includes strategic planning, optimising your business, um, and looking at business continuity uh, and disaster recovery type planning. Uh, with me today, and um, all the way in Longreach, we usually sit one and a half metres away from each other, is my colleague Margot, and I'll just get Margot to uh, introduce herself. Thanks, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. As Mark said, I'm joining you today from Longreach, where I can report people are madly scrambling for their winter woolies with a cold front expected. My role is to apply the food and agribusiness lens to business continuity planning. After 30 plus years as a corporate capital and value advisor, I'm very much part of the industry. In addition to my role with BDO, I'm a non-executive director of Consolidated Pastoral Company, the horticultural company Malgawi, and the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation. I also own and run cattle properties in Western Queensland. So thanks for that, Margot. Um, today's agenda, as, we, as normal, we have a look at the current state of the coronavirus. Um, today, we're gonna to look at some updating you on some challenges and solutions, and Margot is primarily gonna take um, that section um, today. And the backpacker and non-permanent worker um, force that is an issue at the moment, we're gonna look at that and unpack that a little bit for. And we're also gonna give you a quick previous um, recap on the webinar, just so, because there are four in the series, it's good to just have a quick recap of the other three. And if you haven't seen them, we'll point you in the right direction for those. And as always, we try to provide you with some practical business continuity examples. And the ones that we're gonna bring you today are really ones that um, we're seeing across industry that, we, that you can apply uh, moving forward. We'll also be undertaking questions from the audience and answering these at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to submit any questions as we progress through. Uh, in addition today, if you have any business continuity examples that you're doing in your business, please please send them through and, and we'll make sure that those uh, examples that you're doing can be shared with uh, other colleagues across the, the sector or within the industry. We also wanted to make note that when you leave today's webinar, you'll be presented with a survey to gather your feedback on the webinar. Can you please complete that form and also indicate further or future webinar topics that you would like to see covered in relation to continuity? Uh, in, and I guess in particular, what we're going through with COVID. So in relation to the current state of the coronavirus, we are seeing Australia having success in flattening that curve, which everyone keeps speaking about. Um, and positive news recently with several days ago, no new cases being identified in Queensland. We've also seen that COVID testing is being expanded in Queensland and, and may now be done for anyone with a fever or a cough, a sore throat or any shortness of breath. So that's really good. Um, and we've also seen some commencement, commencement of easing of some of the restrictions um, and looking at things like elective surgery coming back online. We're seeing low risk activities also being considered uh, in the recent announcements from government uh, departments across um, Queensland and, and broader Australia. But we'd also caution against any expectation that things will come back online quickly. Um, the governments are really looking at measured approaches uh, to avoid local outbreaks. But if we have a quick look at the case numbers, the cases internationally, uh, unfortunately, continue to grow. Um, so since we did the, the last webinar two weeks ago, which was at 2 million cases. Um, and two weeks later now, globally, it's over 3 million cases, um, which is um, still quite uh, a significant increase when you think about a two week period. Um, there are currently 6,746 cases in Australia as of eight o'clock this morning, um, with eight confirmed in the past 24 hours. Unfortunately, we have also seen 90 deaths due to COVID. By way of comparison though, to the global situation, that's only an additional 258 cases in the past two weeks in Australia, which shows that what we are doing as a nation uh, and in a government is that is working. Today's webinar is in collaboration with the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries and is intended to provide you with some real world examples 
of some continuity responses um, that are taken or being taken at the moment. Post this session, as I said before, we'll send you a copy of the uh, webinar and all the recordings uh, to all the participants. And as usual, we'll start with an update on the challenges and solutions from government and industry perspective. And this is where I'll hand it over to Margot, all the way from Longreach. Thanks, Mark. If I can just start with a few observations across the sector. Uh, the Queensland Government have updated their home confinement movement and gathering direction. From this Saturday, in addition to leaving home for essential purposes, Queenslanders may leave for some recreational activity, including a picnic, going for a drive, taking the boat out, or shopping for books or clothing. Provided you stay within 50 kilometres of home, practice social distancing, and are only joined by people who you usually live with and one other person. While this will not allow you, for example, to go from Longridge to Whitton for a social outing, the slight easing of restriction is serving to lift people's spirits. People are encouraged that we will come out of this. This week, we saw the federal government launch the voluntary COVID contact tracing app, COVID Safe. We have seen a number of organisations encourage their staff to install this application as an additional measure for their continuity planning. If all workers have downloaded the app, with the workers' permission, it would, would be easy to demonstrate to Queensland Health the contact points within a business, should there be a positive COVID case. Also, the Federal Government's Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment last week announced an international freight assistant mechanism program. This program creates a new network of 15 air freight service providers and freight forwarders to accelerate the delivery of agriculture and fishery exports of items such as seafood, including lobsters, premium red meat, including beef, lamb and pork, dairy such as fresh milk and yogurt, and horticulture, in particular premium fruits and packaged salads and, or vegetables. More information is available on the website shown on your screens. We've also seen the announce, announcement of more than 6,000 farmers, businesses, tourism operators and community and sporting clubs won't have to pay state land rent for six months under a series of measures to protect Queensland businesses and jobs. Farmers on pastoral leases will save on average around 3,300. Britain from the British Bullia Shire was on ABC's radio this morning saving, saying that this would save his business 30,000, a not insignificant budget item. There are also reports that JobKeeper payments to processing businesses may allow these processes to pay a higher price for farm imports than would otherwise have been the case. If we could now turn to the Queensland Government Department of Agriculture and Fisheries Working Group to look at the issues they are currently addressing. First, to the Workforce Availability Working Group. The biggest issues they, they are dealing with is around seasonal workers. Seasonal workers looking for harvest work should not show up at a farm. They should register avail their availability at Harvest Trail, and we'll have more detail on that later. Over the next month, there will be an increased requirement for pickers and packers as the citrus season ramps up. The working group has seen situations where local councils are trying to open up local recreational areas or showground to accom accommodate the temporary accommodation requirements. DAF are continuing to work with federal government and relevant Queensland agency to determine how best to implement new visa arrangements in Queensland, aiming for a framework 
that allows farmers to access the workforce they need, as well as ensure appropriate health measures are in place to ensure the ongoing health and wellbeing of our communities. The working group is also continuing to work to map labour supply by region and to compare with labour demand hotspots. From the Workplace Health and Safety Working Group, we're seeing some business, businesses feeling overwhelmed with the process of getting contract skilled workers into Queensland. The advice is that Queensland Health requires health management plans to be lodged for Queensland for staff to cross the Queensland border and that no further isolation is required unless the employees are coming from a hotspot within the last 14 days. Guidelines for meeting social distancing requirements for workers travelling in vehicles is still a concern for members of the working group and this is being addressed by the Office of Industrial Relations. In webinar three, we took you through the Safe Food Queensland checklist for reducing workforce impacts re related to COVID-19. In response to industry feedback, Safe Food Queensland in conjunction with Queensland Health and DAF working group members is currently developing further material focused on meat retailing businesses. From the Supply Chain and Logistic Working Group, our news in relation to air freight from Cairns Airport, Qantas is extending their weekly Sunday freighter service to the end of June with Queensland Government support. This service picks up approximately 40 tonnes of freight from Cairns each week, providing a vital service to the live seaport, seafood export market in particular, which relies on direct flights to get their product to market. Cairns Airport is also working with industry and airlines to secure an additional midweek freight flight to Hong Kong via Cairns. Wellcamp Airport in Toowoomba reports that the Cathay Pacific freighter service to Hong Kong was full this week with a high percentage of perishable cargo. From a sea freight perspective, Port of Brisbane is reporting that input and export container, container throughput for mid-April increased by 31% on the previous week. They are also reporting empty freighter containers being available in Brisbane for beef, freight and vegetable. You may recall that this, the availability of refrigerated containers was a concern earlier. Port of Townsville is reporting live animal export are continuing as normal, both in terms of frequency and volume. Immediate supply chain issues that arose with COVID have now largely been reported as resolved. It, issues now being presented to the supply chain working group are largely specific to particular regions or particular commodities uh, and are being dealt with on a case by case basis. If we turn to the business continuity group, this group continues to meet to discuss this webinar series to make sure it is relevant to you. Please keep raising questions and providing feedback so we can continue to deliver value to you. We understand there is a perception that a positive case will result in a business being shut down. Queensland Health wants to make it clear that this is not necessarily the case. It's all about controlling contact points. As we discuss later, the more documentation and detail you can keep about your continuity response, the better. This includes strategy around demonstrating activity to minimise contact points between workers. Thanks, Margot. Thank you, Mark. Yep, thanks, Margot. Um, Guys, um, 
If you've got any questions, please use the uh, the, the capability on, on your screen to sort of enter in any questions and we'll try and endeavour to answer those uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the session. So thanks for that, Margo. We just have a bit of a look at the backpacker and non-permanent worker uh, arrangements at the moment. The Queensland Government announced yesterday a plan for seasonal workers during the regional harvest season covering self-isolation. A health management plan, communication plans, additional compliance measures and ways to ensure local solutions are developed for local circumstances. They've also um, provided 100 agriculture coordination officers to assist with the implementation. So for further information about that, please visit the business.qld.gov.au website. But to, reiter to reiterate, seasonal workers coming into Queensland need a border pass and you'll need to have the submitted health management plan as Margot discussed. Seasonal workers will also need details of where they have been for the previous two weeks, written confirmation of a job in Queensland, and details of where they plan to reside. And if they are coming from a declared hotspot, they will need to self-quarantine 14 days at their own or the employer's expense. Just a quick reminder of the Queensland Government websites, um, which have a lot of information on COVID, uh, and please keep an eye on these as resources at these websites get updated quite regularly. Also make sure that you are subscribed to the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries weekly email updates in relation to COVID-19 by subscribing to the Agriculture News email newsletter at the URL on your screen. We'll have all these URLs on the screen during our question and answer time at the end of the webinar. So we'll quickly recap on the previous webinars now, um, just for any new attendees on today's um, webinar. Uh, and BDO and Agriculture and Fisheries have conducted three so far. Uh, these previous webinars cover areas you need to consider or seriously think about in helping you manage and navigate your business through the pandemic. These previous webinars are available in full from the BDO website, and, at, and that's at the web page shown on your screen, which is www bdo.com.au forward slash staff webinar series. So just into in a quick uh, overcap, the first webinar we looked at what are the main areas that you need to focus on when um, building out your business continuity plan. And when you think about business continuity plans, these um, five areas that we put on the screen are what we went through in webinar one. And the first one was really about sustainability. It's understanding what important elements are to your business and how you prioritise those. We then went and unpacked um, continuity um, plans around how you respond to get the best out of your available people and resources. We looked at the health and safety element of a business continuity plan, and that's developing plans to ensure that you provide a safe working environment, not only for your customers, but also for um, your people. We also looked at the technology elements of a business continuity plan, where maintaining collaboration and communication and productivity and the security of your information um, is paramount. And the supply chain was a key focus in webinar one where we looked at the vulnerabilities in the early stages of COVID and how impacts uh, and what those impacts might do um, to put risks on your business and the recovery of your business. In webinar two was a bit more practical in nature. We started to give uh, you guys a, um, a, a number of templates or documents that you could just download in Word format and to start sort of populating at your own um, leisure. I guess uh, the key areas that we provided some materials around was your processes and how you go about um, capturing those processes, but more importantly, those critical ones. What are those critical processes in your business that you need to put plans in place um, very urgently? And you've got to think about those response strategies. What do you do if a critical business process is interrupted? And so documenting that response is really key. Uh, Using event logs, how you capture your actions and document those actions in a way that um, uh, is, I guess, really important when you're looking at government funding and insurance uh, claims in the future and having documented evidence of what you've done in the business. And we've given uh, templates for you to fill in for that. Uh, contact information, it's really important that the contact information is in a central location and easily accessible by you when you need it and governance, so in relation to how does your plan fit and who's responsible? So if a particular person does become ill with COVID, who's their backup person? And do they clearly know the things that they need to be doing uh, in your business to get the outcome that you're looking for? 
And quickly in webinar three, um, we discussed the process of evaluating and refining your continuity planning in the light of ongoing developments that they're changing with business uh, constantly and government and looking at measures to introduce uh, and limit the spread of COVID. Uh, Margot um, also took us through deeper dives into the Safe Food Queensland checklist and also the Queensland Health Plan, which we've just talked about around um, backpacker workforce and other bits and pieces, um, and how to complete those and really valuable information in that webinar uh, around how about travelling interstate to Queensland. All three of our webinars are available in full from the BDO website at www.bdo.com.au forward slash staff webinar series. So now turning to the content of today's webinar in a little bit more detail, we've had some feedback from you that um, you want to have real life examples and tips on continuity responses that have occurred across the industry. We'd also like to receive details of any examples, as I said previously, that you've implemented that we can share with the audience today. So once again, please feel free to use that Q&A process to uh, submit any things that you guys are doing out in the business land that you want to share. Generally, we are hearing of good responses from industry. Uh, measures have been put in place to deal with health and safety issues and the initial impacts of these have been dealt with by businesses. BDO and agriculture and fisheries certainly recognise the significant impact of the closure of the food service industry upon the sector. We'll now look at some real life examples and tips for continuity responses and we'll start with the workforce. So the Queensland Government or the Queensland Government Agricultural Workforce Network offices are available to help agribusiness employees during COVID-19 and beyond. They will provide free advice, and that's what I said, free, on workforce attraction, retention and ongoing development of workforce to all Queensland agribusiness regardless of commodity or organisational membership. They'll work with you to understand your workforce needs and connect you with appropriate solutions. A really great resource that you should get in contact with. So DAF's agriculture coordination offices are also available to support. They can help you cut through masses of information to assist you to get to information that you need quickly. And you can see there's an email address on your screen and a customer service centre number 132523. So please get in touch. Help is there for you if you want it. Also to rem remind you to subscribe to DAF's weekly email newsletter on COVID-19, which is the agriculture newsletter. And we'll have a link in our final slide today during the question and answer component. From a workforce demand perspective, many businesses rely on a regular pattern of seasonal workers and a stable permanent workforce. So, but if you need to source additional workers, you can advertise your jobs on the Harvest Trail website or lodge vacancies directly onto job search. And those, both those links are in the, on the screen there today. You can also register your business on the Job Active website to post positions for free. URLs for all those available are on your screen. Also consider contracting a licensed labour hire service um, provider. That's another great avenue to, to help. If you need additional advice on these services, you can contact your local agriculture workforce officer. And these contacts are detailed on the Queensland Agriculture Workforce Network webpage, which is shown on the screen. Lots of great resources there. So now if we just look at some continued examples and what we're seeing in, uh, across industry from a workforce and staffing perspective. We've actually heard of a dairy processor who's experiencing a decline in demand compared to their 2019 results. Um, but they've, what they've taken, they've taken steps to request their staff to take one day a week annual leave to the end of May uh, due to those reduced sales. The seasonal harvesting workforce in the Proserpine district is expected to be sourced locally so we're seeing examples of where the workforce is expected to transition from prawn farming in April into sugarcane harvest time, which is in June. And then we've seen organisations looking at the workforce impacts of critical staff being impacted by COVID. We know of a sugar mill who's exploring the opportunity to attract retired and former staff as a short-term backup to cover workers who may test positive to COVID-19. Now, looking from a health and safety perspective and some examples we're seeing uh, or that we're aware of of businesses that are implementing, there's a grower near Townsville who has taken proactive steps in relation to upcoming workforce requirements around harvest time. They have removed manual paperwork in relation to their workforce application process and are working with their local accommodation provider to enable their electronic submission of application paperwork. 
They've also taken steps to limit the sources, the sources of workers they are employing. They're also working with their accommodation providers to ensure social distancing upheld at the accommodation locations to minimise any risks. They've also made modifications to working environments, for example, additional provision of toilets, sanitisation stations, dining, and limiting the use of shared facilities like kitchens. They've also implemented daily temperature readings for workers. And they are starting to segment or are segmenting their workers to the same specific tasks each day to avoid risks of cross contamination in the workforce. Other initiatives we are aware of are businesses acquiring additional rental houses to accommodate their workforce, and that's to really to comply with the social distancing requirements by, this, by spreading workers across greater areas. Then as Margot spoke about in webinar three, um, the use of different coloured personal protective equipment is being used to clearly indicate workers and teams of workers. Industry associations are continuing to develop and update checklists. We're aware of Berries Australia, the Cane Growers Guides and checklists, but also aware of other associations such as Meat and Livestock, Mangoes, Mushrooms, Grapes and Citrus Australia Guides to name just a few. We recommend continuing to monitor your industry association for any support materials. Taking some examples of the continuity responses from Citrus Australia Guide, a grower measuring temperature of workforce monitoring up to 37 and a half degrees, but if it goes to 38 degrees, they are isolating the worker with masks and gloves and ringing medical center for what happens next. The worker then goes to a halfway house until tests can be done or they isolate for 14 days. They are also continuing to keep workforce informed with emails and updates, practical things like posters in the workplace and in accommodation areas. And, we've all, and as we said before, regular communication is crucial. Another example um, is closing farms and directing all visitors to phone reception. All visitors then sign a health directive, the temperature's taken, they sanitise and then they practise social distancing. They're also managing picking groups into teams and carpooling again to reduce the risk of cross-contamination through the workforce. They're also working with their business partners constantly, like packing sheds and marketers, as an example, to ensure they remain up to date with their practices and have contingency plans in place should anything happen to their organisation. So if we now have a look at some of the supply chain continuity examples, we're hearing that meat workers uh, and storage chains being full. So businesses are now slowing down production, reducing shifts to slow that throughput. This is then obviously impacting on the supply chain, including feedlots and demand for product. From a packing line perspective, we're seeing a slow of production lines and throughout to achieve social distancing measures for workers. There's an example of a Western Queensland meat export company um, reporting that after initial complications due to restrictions, they are now returning to normal. They're seeing a, the border crossing into Queensland as being smooth and seeing no impacts in getting supply to Brisbane. They're also reporting no staffing issues, but have increased staff numbers to deal with their hygiene requirements. Then finally, we had a news of a fingerline producer who received a grant approval to branch into frozen and diversifying their often offering sorry, in response to fruit sales reducing significantly. So if we just now have a look a bit more of a, some practical tips um, around business continuity planning. Finally, we just want to remind you that some of the some of, of some of these tips uh, in relation to continuity planning. Uh, please continue to document your responses, as I said before. Continue to keep up to date with impacts on your business. Look at the industry and government announcements that are being made regularly. Keep pursuing those activities to explore new opportunities, as I mentioned, like the theme, uh, finger line uh, example before. Document the events that have occurred, then take action. The response strategy will be valuable to reflect upon post COVID, but also we're confident that they will be useful for you in future responses. If example, if you have any biosecurity Queensland um, measures like African swine flu, as an example. It is also very important to document the cases where you have not been able to take action. And also to tem demonstrate the activity that you have taken in the event of a positive case. And this is really about reducing your impact on your business moving forward. We've had an example where a cane grower viewed it as not possible to comply with social distancing guidelines when training their staff. So it's important to make notes of this 
and any additional steps that they've taken to try and reduce risks of transmission. Then finally, from an external perspective, um, external auditors or large organisations and other advisors like bankers and insurance, they're going to be very interested in your documentation around business continuity planning ongoing. And this is really about you being able to provide evidence around your strategy and plan, ensuring the ability to continue um, your business in the event of an interruption. Webinar 2 will give you more tips and potential formats that you can download to start documenting your continuity planning. So now we really, this is part of the webinar where we turn to question and answers. I haven't seen any question and answers come through live, but I just would like to take the opportunity just to ask Margot before we wrap up. Is there any other further comments, Margot, that you have um, that we want to sort of add to the webinar today before we wrap up? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, the main point I'd like to make is I think the uh, food and agribusiness industry needs to take a bow. Firstly, for their level of commitment to implementing all the recommendation that government have, have been provided and in their industry organisations. I must say in remote areas of Australia where you, you could have had a situation where people could have a thinking that you know it's not doesn't apply to me that hasn't been the case um, they've been very committed to um, abiding by all the recommendation and the other reason I think the industry needs to take about is for the collaboration and leadership that has been shown and you need to look no further I think than uh, to the US where you've seen as an example in the meat processing industry a number of businesses being shut um, due to the um, number of COVID cases within those processing plants. So I, I just encourage all involved in the industry to take a bow. You're not going to believe this, Margot, but a question's come through while you were talking. Um, and there's a question from Jean. Um, Jean wants to know what processes or steps for bringing workers back, let's say in the next six months. Do you believe um, details such as where they have been interstate or international um, will become a standard requirement and expand um, to other viruses moving forward? I, I think at this point it's very hard to look forward to six months. Um, all we can do is look at the advice on a, well, it's almost on a day by day basis and follow whatever the guidelines are. Yeah, no, no I agree. Um, so look, thank you everybody for your attendance today. Um, please feel free to contact Margot or myself if we can assist you or your organisation in relation to your continuity responses. As you leave today's webinar, you'll be presented with a survey to gather your feedback on the webinar. Please complete that survey and also indicate any future topics you would like to see covered. Um, BDO and DAC obviously review all that feedback received and um, we've got, and it sort of guides the next webinar if needed. BDO will provide a copy of this webinar shortly and we'll add it to BDO's webpage in the coming days. But on behalf of the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries and BDO, we'd like to thank you for your time and attendance at today's webinar.